Hey everybody, it's Michelle with Florida Keys Birding and today um, we're going to continue talking about the indigo bunting. We're going to talk about some facts. Um, we're going to talk about how to ID them, identification, behavior, nesting, food, habitat, all that good stuff. All the stuff that you want to know about the indigo bunting. So on the last video we went a deep dive into migration and we're going to talk a little bit more about you know the habits and all of that. So um, a couple cool facts about the indigo bunting. Um, they learn their song as babies uh, but they learn it from nearby males and not directly from the fathers so that's kind of interesting um, and buntings a few hundred yards apart will generally sing different songs while those in the same song neighborhood share nearly identical songs that's pretty interesting and listen to this a local song may persist up to 20 years generally changing as new singers add novel variations that's interesting because that's almost like human language you know we have like a genre of um, you know certain things we say um, in certain generations that in other generations we don't so that's really cool and that's I thought that was a really interesting fact so um, almost similar to our language <laughs> so um, okay so indigo and las uh, lazuli buntings defend territories against each other in the western great plains where they occur together and they share songs and sometimes interbreed I would like to see one that interbreeds that makes a hybrid <laughs> that would be really neat somebody just did see a lazuli bunting on dry tortugas um, a couple of days ago and indigo buntings have been making their way through the keys like I said in the previous video for the last couple of weeks my first time getting to see one um, has just been this this week actually this past weekend so um, so yeah really really cool they've been moving through the keys I have a, a pretty good story about how I found one at, at the end so um, okay so indigo buntings are uh, let's talk about ID so they're small um, they're probably about the size of a sparrow or smaller and um, they're kind of stocky birds with short tails um, a short thick bill and it's called a conical bill kind of looks to me like kind of a cardinal bill a little bit you know but it's it's pretty you know distinctive and in flight the birds will ap appear more plump um, with short rounded tails um, so these birds do go through a molt in the fall and in the spring they will look different in fall plumage than they will in spring and you can see in some photos here of both so the breeding male indigo bunting in the breeding male indigo bunting <laughs> is blue all over so they have that you know you can see in the pictures here um, they've got that bright beautiful blue color it's like it's indigo <laughs> that's what it is um, and so it's it's uh, it's very rich uh, around the head and they have that shiny silvery gray grayish looking bill um, and the females are basically like a brown with some streaking on the breast, a, a whitish throat, and sometimes a little bit of blue on the wing or tail or on the rump. And immature males are like patchy blue-brown. So I have pictures of that too here. You can kind of see both and how they look. And like all other birds, um, the indigo bunting does actually lack a blue pigment. I know it looks blue, but it's not actually blue. Um, you know, it's actually due to microscopic structures in the feathers that refract and reflect blue light, uh, much like, you know, airborne particles that cause the sky to look blue. So it's more of a refraction than it is an actual, you know, like colors. So it's the same way with blue jays, it's the same way with blue birds, it's the same way with hummingbirds. Um, it's the same. Yeah, so they don't actually have a pigment melanin of blue. Um, you know, they're actually more of like a brown black hue um, that you can see if you hold a feather up so the light will come from behind it instead of towards it. And you know, that's interesting because when I tell you my little story at the end, the bird did look black because it was behind the sun and when I went on the other side to see it, it, it looked blue. So that's, that's true. 
<laughs> that is true. The sciences have it right. So we didn't doubt them. We didn't doubt them at all. Okay, so um, the behavior of the male indigo bunting um, is like they'll sing from treetops, shrubs, and telephone lines and during the summer and breeding season. Um, and the species will, will eat things like um, seeds, berries, and uh, you can attract them to your backyard with stuff like thistle or niger seed. So similar to like a goldfinch, you know, they eat that same kind of thing. And while perching, they'll often swish their tails from side to side. Fairly, um, they'll be fairly solitary. They're, they're pretty much, um, you know, by themselves during breeding season. Um, and indigo buntings will form large flocks though during migration when they're on their wintering ground. So you'll see flocks of them mostly during migration. Um, you know, you'll see them foraging seeds and gleaning insects off of low branches and vegetation, um, and they'll kind of hop along uh, the ground and cling, you know, to stems and reeds and stuff like that. Um, and then singing males will tend to perch high in shrubs and trees or on telephone lines. And when disturbed, an indigo bunting may fly to the top of a tree shrub. I have noticed, I feel like they're kind of shy. So, um, yeah, and they'll raise their crest of feathers and they'll swing their tails from side to side. Um, so indigo buntings usually forage alone during the breeding season and on their wintering grounds um, during spring and fall migration, they will feed in flocks on lawns and open grasslands. And males defending territories will approach each other with a slow fluttering butterfly type display, holding their wings at right angles to their bodies. Well, that's pretty interesting. I haven't seen that. The ones I saw today was two males together and uh, they were just chilling. <laughs> they were just hanging out. They didn't seem like they were bothering each other. Um, and early in the breeding season, you may see two males grappling in the air and falling to the ground, singing loudly and clasping to each other's feet. So yeah, the ones I saw earlier today were not doing that. So I guess they're not, you know, they're not bothering one another. Not quite yet. They're not quite to their breeding grounds yet. So as far as food goes, the indigo bunting eats small seeds, berries, buds, and insects. Common seed forage includes thistles, dandelions, goldenrods, and grains such as oats. Berries eaten include blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, service berries, and elderberries. So watch your plants. <laughs> Spiders and insects, uh, insect prey which form the majority of their diet during the summer months may include caterpillars, grasshoppers, aphids, cicadas, beetles, canker worm, click beetles, and weevils. The brown-tailed moth caterpillar, which is covered with noxious hairs that cause a nasty rash and respiratory problems in people, presents no obstacle to a hungry bunting. Wow, that's pretty interesting. So they, they can eat these apparently. Um, I have noticed that the buntings do like seeds and you know flower buds and like stuff like that. I have seen them doing that and I, I've seen them foraging on um, like the little bugs that are in the blooms and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, so this is kind of what I've noticed as far as them feeding and I fe I've seen them feeding on like grass seeds and stuff like that in the fall. Um, so yeah, so on arrival to their breeding grounds in the spring, um, indigo buntings may feed on twigs, buds, leaves of trees, including aspen, cottonwood, oaks, beech, elm, maple, and hickory. So yeah, that makes sense. I've seen them eating the little buds. Um, I've seen them, you know, eating the, the, you know, seeds from different plants and stuff like that. So, um, so that definitely makes sense. So as far as habitat goes, um, you can look for them in weedy and brushy areas, which is true. Um, I would say that this is where I've seen them most of the time, um, especially, you know, where fields meet forests. So, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly where I find them, <laughs> I would have to say. Um, they love the edges, uh, hedge groves, overgrown patches, and brushy roadsides. Yeah, that's... That's exactly where I find them. I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's exactly where I see them. Um, so that when they're not singing from the tallest perches in the area, they can often be seen foraging among, among seed laden um, scrubs and grasses. So yeah, that's pretty much what I have observed, uh, especially in the fall and in the spring. Yeah, yeah, this is where they, 
this is where they be <laughs> so um, so as far as nesting goes um, they nest in fields and edges of woods roadsides and railroad right-of-ways oh wow I can't say I've seen that but that's pretty interesting um, the female will choose a concealed nest site in a low vegetation within a meter of the ground and she locates the nest or um, in you know in the crotch of a fork uh, where branches will meet something kind of like that um, amid a supporting network of vertical and diagonal twigs um, so occasionally an indigo bunting builds her nest in crop plants like corn or soybeans I guess that makes sense There's a little pocket in there and the corn you know uh, corn thing so you know I could see that happening so as far as the description of how they nest, you know, and uh, nesting, the female indigo bunting will build a nest alone, uh, a process that takes up to eight days early in the season and as little as two days later in the summer. The male may watch but does not participate. So the nest is an open cup woven with leaves, grasses, stems, bark, uh, and wrapped with spider web. The inside of the cup is lined with slender grasses, tiny roots, strips of thin bark, thistle down, and sometimes even deer hair. Oh wow, that's pretty interesting. They are resourceful. <laughs> the cup is about 1.5 inches deep inside with an outside diameter of 3 inches and an inside diameter of about 2 inches or so. They usually do um, 3 to 4 eggs and 1 to 3 broods a year and the incubation period is about 11 to 14 days with the nestling period about 8 to 14 days and their eggs are unmarked white and a few have some brown spots and um, you know the hatchlings are naked you know with a little sparse down with the eyes closed and helpless just you know as you would see any other baby bird so let me tell you a little story <laughs> so um, I was riding my bike and um, the thing is is that so far in the past so I have had indigo buntings before in the fall and I had had one encounter last spring with an indigo bunting I've always wanted to get pictures of one in breeding plumage but the problem was is that um, yeah every time I would see one quickly it would be gone that's what happened to me last spring so you know I only had pictures of the indigo bunting in fall plumage which was you know like the brownish with a little bit of blue you know not much but I really wanted that bright blue plumage those really beautiful shots so everybody had been seeing them in the keys and I hadn't gotten one yet um, so finally I was I had was riding my bike I came around the corner and as soon as I come around the corner what's there in front of me the indigo bunting male right in front of me perfect shot on a plumeria and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is my chance. I'm like, please don't leave, please don't leave. So I grab my camera, I turn it on, I put it up to my eye, and lo and behold, my lens is fogged up. I'm frantically trying to unfog my lens because, uh, you know, here in the summertime, um, the humidity is so high that when you come out of your house, your lens fogs up for a while and it takes a little bit of time to unfog it. So I'm sitting here, I'm frantically, and I'm like, no, 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 come on, you can't be doing this right now. Like, this is the perfect shot, it's right in front of me. I mean, and that bird stays there for about two minutes while I'm trying to unfog my lens, trying to take a shot, trying to unfog my lens. Lens just keeps fogging up every single time I try to get a shot. And then of course, it flies away. I want to cry. <laughs> In this moment, I want to cry. I am like, no, I can't believe this. I can't believe I missed the shot. 
So I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to find this bird. So I watch it as it flies away. I'm like looking in the direction. I go down the street. I ride my bike down the street. I'm looking for it, looking for it. I don't see it. I go down the next street. I go all the way down the next street. I come all the way back. I'm looking for it. I go on the other side of the street. I go down that street. I'm go I went down like four or five different streets looking for this darn bird. And I don't see it. And I'm just like... I can't and I just want to cry right now I just want to I'm just like I can't believe this happened and I'm like God please let me find this bird <laughs> I'm literally praying I'm literally desperate at this point I'm like I can't believe I missed this this is like and it was a bright blue fully you know full-on bright blue plumage uh, indigo bunting male it was beautiful so I'm like, you know what? I was like, whatever. I'm just going to go home. I'm riding back to the house. And um, I'm like, whatever. I'll just go look for warblers or something. And I look up and I see a bird in the Jamaica dogwood. Kind of high up in the tree. And I'm like, oh, you know. On first glance, I'm thinking it's a Cape May. I'm thinking it's a Cape May warbler. Because usually you see the Cape Mays up in the dogwoods. You know, eating the blooms and, you know, stuff like that. Um... I get a little closer and I'm like, wait, that's, that's, that's too big to be a warbler, but it's too small to be a cardinal. And I'm like, and, and I, I'm like in front, I'm like facing the sun. So the bird is like behind, the sun is behind it. So the bird, it looks black and I, and I can't tell what it is. So I, I'm like, hold up. I'm like, could it be, could it be the bunting? I zoom my camera in, I see something that looks dark blue. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, oh, I think it's the indigo bunting. So I slowly move. I take a, sh a few shots just in case because I'm like, whatever. I'm going to just lighten it up if worse comes to worse if it is. But I'm not going to lose the shot. And I go around. I get myself so that my back is to the sun and the sun is facing the bird. And sure enough, it is the bright blue indigo bunting. I was so happy. I mean, it was it was amazing. I was so excited. I got a million shots of this bird. This bird stayed on this tree forever. It stayed on there for so long that I had so many shots that I was satisfied and done that I was like, all right, I'm good. And I left. And that was that. Um, I was probably there for like 20 minutes taking pictures and videos of this bird so yeah that was my story super exciting and then lo and behold i ended up with four more sightings of indigo buntings for this spring so it was pretty great so anyways so i just want to tell you guys that story um it was super exciting i know if you're a birder <clears throat> you've been there and you know how it is um so um so yeah it was it was great so as you can see i got a lot of good pictures um the spring of the of the blue um full breeding plumage indigo bunting so so yay that's my success story of spring i hope you learned a little bit more about this bird today and i hope you get to see one this summer in your area if you're up north and you're not in florida they have just about gone from my area by now as far as i know i haven't seen any more than the sightings that i had already seen recently um, but they're probably up by the people that are up north already so I hope you guys get some at your feeder and I hope you get to see some babies this year. Alright, thanks. Bye!